Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, my name is Ben Penner. And as Matt uh, indicated, I am a farmer. I am a small, small grain farmer located in St. Peter, Minnesota, southern Minnesota. And um, I have uh, wear a number of hats. Um, I am a uh, father, <laughs> three daughters, and I have uh, a small farm that I, I grow, market, and sell uh, small grains, and then have a direct customer business where uh, those grains are on store shelves around the state of Minnesota, as well as in Kansas, um, in the form of whole grain and all-purpose wheat flour. Uh, so that's kind of a, a broad overview. I got into Kernza a number of years ago um, <clears throat> yeah, for a range of reasons, which I'll try to kind of go into as we go along here. But my current hat today that I'm wearing is I am the vice president of a newly formed cooperative called the Perennial Promise Growers Cooperative. And as I'm uh, discussing this, I'll uh, uh, hopefully give you an opportunity to find out uh, ways where you can be involved if, you would, uh, if it seems like a, a good fit for you and your operation. Um, <clears throat> So the Perennial Promise Growers Cooperative, you can see in that photo right there that we have been meeting over Zoom, actually, mostly during the pandemic and forming this cooperative. But that was one of our uh, initial meetings where we, um, we actually were able to be in person. We're standing in a field of Kernza right there, right outside of uh, St. Peter, Minnesota, one of the first in the county and uh, really on the forefront of what was planted in the state um, in uh, 2019 and uh, 2020. Uh, so you can see just kind of from that photo that that there's a highly collaborative group that's working on this. And, and honestly, it's uh, kind of a pastoral scene, which I appreciate. Um, so who are we? Uh, the Perennial Promise Growers Cooperative uh, will provide uh, direction and assistance to farmers interested in growing and marketing Kernza. As Matt stated, Kernza is uh, the trademark name by the Land Institute of Intermediate Wheatgrass. Uh, so Kernza is a trademark, intermediate wheatgrass is what the, what the plant is called. Um, and our goal is to provide planting, growing, harvesting, and marketing um, uh, expertise and uh, provide logistical and processing network services and expertise for scaling up the production of Kernza. Uh, in the future, we're aiming towards commercializing other continuous living cover crops, which are a suite of crops being developed by the University of Minnesota, uh, such as winter camelina, pennycress, and uh, similar crops. So in addition to Kernza, we have our eyes on uh, a number of, of other crops that, that we hope to see on the landscape in the near future. In addition to that, and I think this is a really important piece, is that we will work with our partners to commercialize ecosystem services um, provided by these cropping systems. So uh, Kernza is a grain, it is a forage, and it also provides additional benefits that can be brought into uh, the, uh, the system and with, with the goal of bringing that value back to the landowner, back to the farmer, back to the grower, and, and ultimately our communities and, and our states. Um, had a lot of activity, and I'd like to highlight one that is brand new. Uh, we've got a, a board member who has been working uh, in Wisconsin, actually, and uh, developed this new website. So if you want to type in uh, perennialpromise.com, you can see the very first beginnings of a new website, where, uh, which will be the portal for all things Perennial Promise Growers Cooperative. A little bit bare bones at the moment, but you will find more as you visit that website in the future. So why Kernza? Um, I would imagine that many of you have heard of Kernza already, but just as a quick and broad overview, the first commercially available perennial, uh, perennial grain Sorry, Ben, I just had to mute you for a minute to minimize the background noise here. I'm going to have you uh, unmute yourself. Gotcha. Again. All Thanks. right. Um, okay, so it's the first commercially available perennial grain in the US. 
And it's really in the early stages of market development, even though it has been ongoing since uh, uh, the 80s, first at the Rodale Institute, and then the Land Institute in, the, uh, in, in Kansas. And now uh, a, a, lot, a hub of activity is going on at the University of Minnesota. Um, it offers a new and compelling vision for production agriculture. So it's quite a bit different in that it's a perennial and uh, grows for multiple years without having to uh, till it up and, um, and replant every year. There is a limit to that, however, and I'll get into, uh, Luke Peterson might get into that a little bit more later. Um, really, the vision of this grain, I think, is, you know, we're, we're aiming towards being uh, both transformative, but also kind of working within the existing channels and knowledge bases that, uh, that, that frankly, we have on the landscape. And so, um, you know, many, many communities and states and municipalities have uh, uh, environmental goals that are, are being um, uh, brought to the forefront. And perennial agriculture, and specifically Kernza, it seems to fit a niche where that, those two things could be brought together in, in one particular kind of crop. Um, there's quite a bit of interest from breweries, restaurants, and kind of uh, from chefs who, who have been uh, experimenting for the last several years and creating new products that are on, on the shelves. Let's see. Oh, okay. um, so why, uh, <laughs> if this new uh, this new crop is so great. Why isn't it everywhere? Uh, well, we are developing uh, really kind of a brand new market. It's a new, uh, it's grain, but it's sort of a new market category. Um, and, you know, it, it has, a, has very different characteristics from a lot of what is already uh, in, in the system. Uh, there's significant um, activity going around price discovery, and so finding out where exactly that that will will end up is a major focus of uh, the cooperative right now. Um, I think you know yield is is certainly lower than than the traditional crops that are out there, and is at, at a different scale. Uh, we're talking in pounds and not necessarily in bushels at the moment. And <clears throat> there's kind of a chicken and an egg problem uh, where the networks that are really required to support this new crop, they're being built, we're sort of building the ship while we're sailing it. And so part of our work is to connect those dots between um, uh, end use customers, uh, cleaners, uh, storage and processing networks and making that entire uh, puzzle come together in a coherent way. In addition to that, uh, if you haven't grown a perennial on your on your farm yet, uh, as far as for, for a grain, there's quite a bit of uh, a learning curve. I myself have uh, harvested um, uh, uh, two crops of Kernza, and I can tell you there is no Kernza setting on my uh, 9500 John Deere combine. So it takes a lot of trial and error and getting, getting the Kernza to a point where you can uh, actually bring it to the marketplace uh, takes quite a, bit of, quite a bit of learning. I enjoy it, I'm a farm nerd, so that's, that's a lot of fun. Also, even though there's quite a bit of consumer awareness around the crop, it's still, you know, it's still up and coming. I think there's a, uh, the vision is out there, but not necessarily how can we, you know, how is this going to benefit our lives? How is it going to improve the food that I eat every day. So that's a problem that we need to, uh, to overcome. And of course, quantifying the ecosystem services, uh, there are a lot of good research networks working on that, uh, but we need to come to agreement on exactly what the value is of those services. Plus just the obvious, uh, we are significantly behind, uh, although we're making great progress, significantly behind where, uh, where the traditional crops uh, have been. Um, I think we're making uh, significant progress, uh, especially at the University of Minnesota and elsewhere in, in speeding that up significantly. <clears throat> so to that point, um, the USDA has funded a $10 million grant 
to uh, the University of Minnesota and um, many people who are involved in growing and marketing Kernza are, are, are part of that and trying to really uh, bring both the social and economic aspects of Kernza as well as the research and germplasm uh, uh, updates uh, into the field that, that are necessary. So that's a five-year grant and there's quite a bit of exciting um, activity going on around that. It's called the Kernza Cap. So if you Google that Kernza Cap, you'll learn more about that or you can go to kernza.org, K-E-R-N-Z-A dot O-R-G and learn more there as well. Um, <clears throat> I, the, I, one component that I'd like to just dwell on for a moment is, is the uh, social aspect of bringing a new, new crop at, uh, in, into, um, onto the marketplace. So one unique feature about the Kernza cap is that, is that we're, uh, really trying to um, understand what the social networks are, like I described before, between those different nodes along the supply chain and how to both fold into that the existing supply chain, but also creating new structures that can help support it for those other crops that will come online in the future. There's quite a bit of activity around that. Um, <clears throat> the way it looks right now, total is that there are approximately uh, uh, 5,000 acres as of last year of Kernza grown in the United, uh, planted in the United States. Those are active acres, about 54 growers. I'm one of them. And the average yields is in the neighborhood of 409 pounds. You can see, you know, close uh, about not quite three quarters of a million pounds of grain was harvested. Most of those acres are in Montana, Kansas, and Minnesota. Uh, and it breaks out uh, conventional and organic in, as in that chart. Um, our drilling down to our marketing cooperative and what we are um, working with as a cooperative, there are about 1,100 active acres out of uh, 1,700 plants at all time. And the reason for that is that some acres uh, actually, you know, it, it was a difficult crop to establish in some cases, so some of them did not did not make it to harvest. But it's also every three years, uh, the recommendations are to um, uh, uh, um, plant a new crop, and that's really because of where the germplasm is at right now. That may change in the future, but currently the crop yield drops off after about three years. So best practice is is to have it go for three years. <clears throat> we have around uh, thirty members mostly in uh, Minnesota, but some in Iowa, Wisconsin, South Dakota. And we are aiming towards being really that upper Midwest hub of Kernza. <clears throat> if, uh, if you uh, Google uh, Kernza and food, you'll find all manner of different uh, um, high profile uh, treatments of it. So Martha Stewart, uh, call it a super grain that's good for you and the planet. Uh, there was a recent article in the Washington Post that uh, really beautifully highlighted uh, the benefits of the grain. And in Whole Foods called it, Whole Foods Market called it one of their top uh, top 10 food trends for 2022. Our group, as I mentioned, has been meeting online in Zoom and sometimes in person uh, since about, since 2019. So, Many of you on this call will likely know uh, Carmen Fernholtz, who is our president. And he uh, really is a pioneering farmer. He has won numerous awards for his work, um, including a Lifetime Achievement Award at, uh, at Rodale recently. <clears throat> He's the president and uh, uh, is, um, was with A-Frame Farm um, over in Madison, Minnesota. I believe he's been growing Kernza or intermediate wheatgrass with Don Wise at the University of Minnesota since I think 2010 or 2011. So the knowledge base for Kernza rests with Carmen. And we're trying to uh, distribute that uh, more broadly now. Uh, I'm the vice president. Stan Vanderkoy uh, is, is a, our treasurer. And Ann Schwegerl, who is also the vice president of the Minnesota Farmers Union, is uh, um, our secretary. 
And so she's been involved with uh, policy issues relating to uh, Kernza and relating to our cooperative. Willie Hughes uh, developed the website. He's a farmer in, in uh, Janesville, Wisconsin, Jay Peterson, who I'm gonna highlight him in a little bit about his, his expertise is, is a board member and really an operational uh, wizard. So we've got a great team. Then Luke Peterson, who's gonna be speaking here in a minute, is also is now um, uh, managing A-Frame Farm out in Madison and is really on the forefront of many of the marketing initiatives as well as agronomic initiatives that we have, uh, that we have undertaken. He was just out in California a few days ago meeting with uh, consumer packaged goods companies and really driving home the value of, of Kernza for our marketplace. In addition to that, um, we have hired a marketer. So in order to get this product to market in a marketing cooperative, we need a dedicated marketer. And we found that in Mad Ag, um, which is based in Boulder, Colorado, uh, with, some, uh, with Alex Heilman, who's the director of marketing, uh, located in Minneapolis. And so the two, Alex and Elizabeth worked together to be both our public uh, marketing face, as well as our in the trenches face, uh, working with, um, with large scale and small scale buyers around the country. We have an advisor with uh, Mark Ryland and Colin Kirton at the Forever Green Initiative. <clears throat> Why a cooperative rather than going out into the marketplace yourself? Uh, this is a question that comes up uh, quite a bit. And what we believe is that by working together, we can approach the marketplace in a unified and a strategic way that, uh, that really drives home what the value of the crop is to the end use customer, as well as provide support for those logistical and infrastructure hurdles that any given producer may not be able to do on their own. Uh, if they would, you know, it, it, it's pretty difficult for a very large company to work with, let's say 30 different farmers on uh, with a nascent crop. But we think that together that we can have some, uh, some power in the marketplace and discuss, uh, discuss the uh, benefits of the crop and, and come to an equilibrium on what the value is. Uh, over over time, <clears throat> we also have a very strategic strategic um, relationship with the University of Minnesota and the Forever Green Initiative, and uh, will likely be um, we are we're aiming towards having access to those new varieties that they come online. The variety that I've planted and I believe that is still uh, still available is the Min Minnesota Clearwater variety. So it's a Relatively early release is the first release, but uh, there are significant leaps ahead going on in the research lab that will allow the yield to increase, the shattering to um, decrease, and the threshability to also increase. So that perhaps one of these days, we can actually have a free threshing variety in our combines and we can avoid some of that uh, initial infrastructural uh, log jam. So here's what we've done. I want to make sure I'm still on time. I think I am. Um, we formed a steering committee, drafted articles of incorporation, posted a number of field days, and uh, have an inventory management tool that we use to try to keep and balance the supply and the demand as we understand it. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, we hired a marker, marketer in 21 and 22. And we uh, completed a capital campaign as well as a, a market feasibility study. So all of this is sort of going on in the background and trying to inform what information that we can provide for our membership and for the grower and for the end use customer to bring those, those, uh, uh, those pieces together. We also began brokering sales uh, for, for grower members and sales have been, uh, been moving along. Uh, they need to be quite a bit larger in order to capture what we believe is the, uh, the true value of this crop in, in the marketplace. Phase three, I mentioned Jay Peterson a little bit ago, um, one of our board members, and what we're looking 
to do as a benefit of membership right now is, is we just purchased um, a mobile processing unit, which our vision is for it to be uh, available to go around to farms and actually uh, do the initial cleaning and uh, cleaning process uh, on farm. So in order to access that benefit, you'd have to be a member of Perennial Problems Growers Corp. Um, but we also, we're the ones that are doing it first. Jay has done his first uh, tests of, of cleaning in, um, <clears throat> in this bench industries cleaner. And we're pretty excited about the results because that one step brings us far closer to the end use customer than we've been yet in the past. <clears throat> That's a picture of what we just brought home a few weeks ago. So you might see that on your farm and hopefully with a uh, large uh, perennial promise uh, design on the side. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, we are let we are farmer led and we have six uh, kinds of growers in Minnesota, Wisconsin on that board and we meet uh, weekly and and uh, build a new organization from scratch. We're closely aligned with the Forever Green Initiative and their new um, there are new releases going on uh, at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we want to be a clearinghouse uh, for product discovery, networking, agronomic, and technical information to growers. We want to uh, bring into balance uh, supply and demand and make sure that that supply is reliable for our end use customers. So they know they come to us and we will give them what they need uh, so that their product timelines can be met, uh, met accurately. Uh, we'll be a uh, working on ecosystem services and uh, identifying what the value is to the farmer <clears throat> and bring val the value back to our communities. So if you're interested, you can contact me um, uh, or Carmen Fernholtz and I put his uh, phone, cell phone number right there in the, in the last slide uh, or email us at info at perennialpromise.com. Thank you for your time. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ben. I appreciate that. Um, and in full disclosure, I mean, we're, um, as a seed supplier, have kind of worked with uh, the Perennial Promise folks as well to uh, both raise kerns of seed and kind of supply that that market too. So we're really happy to kind of play our small little part in, in uh, hopefully making this crop um, have a long-term viability um, in, in the state and in the region. Um, yeah. If I may, Matt, that you know that just highlights really the strength of our networks, and I think there's just a, a tremendous team effort going on uh, to get this this new crop off the ground. So appreciate that. Um, maybe if you wouldn't mind, um, and Luke can chime in on this as well. Um, I just shared the Perennial Promise Growers Co-op uh, link to the website in the chat, so you can people can check that out. What are what have been kind of your um, yield ranges? I know you posted. Um, you know, it's as low as 200 pounds and maybe up to a thousand pounds and your average is 400, but your own individual. Yep. Yeah, it's, that's a great question. And it, it varies quite a bit. You know, we had a drought year this year, so we got to kind of experience what kerns it can do in a drought. Um, it's that 400 is, is the average we've had up to, I have not had it, but we've had up to 750 or more pounds per acre. And we have to clarify a little bit here because there's a difference between clean and dirty pounds. Sure. So hold pounds are heavier than the de hold pounds. And it's usually about a 40, 50% clean out. So you take that, cut it in half, and that's what you've got. Um, but it does range, that range from 200 to, to 500, I think is a pretty basic, uh, uh, you can you can aim for that. Gotcha, gotcha. And um, Luke, if you're there too, you know, that might be a good place uh, for you to, to chime in as well, which kind of your experience has been with, with yields anyway, before we transition over to you. Sure. Um, so as far as yield goes, I've had as high as a thousand pounds per acre, and that is off the field. That's uh, been run pounds. And I've had as low as 350. So they do yield. A lot of it depends on the fertility that's put down the year before. Um, as with like most perennials, there's always that freak year where like an apple tree will just be abundant. And I think that's what happened that one year that I had. 
um, that high yield. But I think that 400 is pretty consistent. <clears throat> and um, kind of lead me, I'll just kind of lead right into planting. Um, and if you have more questions about yield, just, just throw it in the chat or whatever. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead and share your screen if, uh, if you're involved here. Yeah, we can. Uh, I don't have I don't have a slide or anything um, to present, but I can just go through planting and harvesting and combine settings if that's okay. Oh yeah, you bet. Um, and Ben, thank you. You did a, a great job there. And um, I'll just kind of start out with with planting Kernza. Um, uh, first of all, Luke Peterson, A Frame Farms, um, Madison, Minnesota. Started working with Carmen Fernhals, um, two thousand. 14 or 15, I believe. Um, got to see some of the early varieties in the trailer and then all the way through to some of the newer varieties. We have some of the latest releases from the university planted on the farm. Um, also another benefit of being part of the cooperative is that uh, communication between the university and our co-op. Um, <clears throat> the experience that I've had with planting is it's a crop that likes to be planted uh, sometime around August 15th. I've planted it as early as August 7th, and I've planted it as, you know, late as like September 2nd. Um, the crop does have to vernalize, and it, in order to produce seed, it does have to have three leaflet or three uh, blades of grass, three leaflets before, uh, you know, it does freeze up. Um, it likes to have, you know, we don't have that problem here, but um, it's five weeks below 55 degrees is what it needs to, uh, you know, from fall planting through spring in order to produce seed. Um, and in order to get it in, obviously you got to think about your rotation and incorporate a small grain into your system um, so you can get it in August 15th. So the planting process kind of has to start pretty early in the year if you're thinking about growing Kernza. Um, I planted it behind flax, behind barley, uh, behind buckwheat, behind winter wheat and spring wheat. Um, you know, it's one of those things It may not matter. I've had the best luck after buckwheat and I think it has to do with the soil structure. Um, if you're planting this crop organically, um, you have to treat it as an organic crop. You have to have, you know, a good seed bed, make sure you have a good rotation. So your weed pressure is down. I would also also recommend having a good hold on your perennial weeds, such as Canadian thistle. Uh, from what I've seen, Kernza does not, it competes with them and grows alongside of perennial weeds, but it will not outcompete them. So if you're if you're already starting out with a bad perennial weed problem like thistle, Canadian thistle, um, that probably isn't a good thing. It probably will get worse as time goes on. I always feel like the truth is better than uh fiction so i'm just giving you the uh, the good and the bad here but i have that's had helpful to have an un unvarnished view for sure yeah because you can be three years in and the field looks great you don't see the thistle out there and i took a field off this last fall and it was thistle from one end to the other so it um treat it as an organic crop if you're growing it organically uh, have keep all those things in mind um so Luke, one, one question that came up, um, and this may be on other people's minds as well, but um, if it's viable or highest yielding for two or three years, are you working it up after the third year or do you leave it as a grazing crop or is it kind of depend a little bit? It depends. It, it depends a little bit. You know, we've had some ups and downs in the markets, and I think that'll also play into what you do with it, um, whether you take it as a forage or whether you're comfortable with taking it as a grain. But after the third year, specifically to the question, um, I've done two two different, there's two things that I've tried. I've tried waiting till the springtime um, to terminate it, just to keep the soil covered over the winter. One year, it worked fantastic. Went out there with a rock disc, John Deere heavy rock disc, disced it up. It was minimal disturbance, and it worked great. It was a drier spring. I thought I was gonna do that again. And we had a spring where the rain never quit. Uh, and it was a mess. It, it, I was unable to plant a cash crop into that field because it was so soddy and so hard to work with just because it was mud. 
Um, so this last fall, what I did is I went through it with a uh, straight tooth on my chisel plow. And I came back with sweeps after the first pass with straight tooth to undercut the roots. And now I know that I'm going to be safe next spring to go into a crop like corn uh, or sunflowers or something like that. Um, but um, yeah, and I will tell you that terminating the crop, uh, it does pull hard. I have a 8520 uh, track tractor, and I think it's a 12 foot chisel plow behind me. And with straight teeth on first pass, it would stop the tractor. And that's because it is a massive root system uh, underneath underneath this crop. It is unbelievable, the root system that's underneath of it. Um, so just keep that in mind. It does tear up pretty hard. It's pretty soddy. It's like tearing up CRP. And after three years of roots, um, that root density isn't just at the top. It's like 10 feet down, which is one of the great benefits of the crop. But kind of back into uh, the planting, um, 10 to 15 pounds per acre, depending on pure live seed. Uh, have a small grain ahead of it so you can get it in early enough. Um, I've seen multiple spacings from six inches up to 10 inches, and they've all worked just fine. Um, planted at a half inch to three quarters of an inch deep. I have, uh, we got our, well, I have planted it deeper, like an inch and a quarter, and got a little nervous, and it still came up fine but the soil texture was was really good that year. Um, I have noticed the difference between planting it before and after a rain. So I planted a, quite a few acres one fall, a rain broke it up and it's such a light and such a small seed. And we've been getting such uh, big rain events that it'll actually move the seed around because after buckwheat, unfortunately the ground is very mellow and very exposed because all of that trash just disappears for whatever reason. And the Kernza seed will move around and it'll get at different depths. I, and I think the rain I'm talking about, it was four inches in like an hour and a half. It was something ridiculous. Um, and then I planted after that four inch rain when the ground just crusted over and it was just enough to carry the tire tracks on the track on the tractor and the drill. And it was it was an absolute perfect stand and it all came up evenly. Um, so just be cautious. Uh, nobody knows the answers to, you know, rain events or organic farming, but just use your experience with other crops to make a determination on if you should plant it before or after. Um, you always think I got to get it in. It's going to get too late. Um, but I would recommend just waiting until the conditions are right. And um, go from there. But um, as far as after it's planted, um, organically, there isn't much you can do. Uh, conventionally, 2,4-D is, I'm pretty sure, allowed now. I don't, I, I, I don't know for sure if it's for the food grade. It's something to check into, but I think it is for feed and seed for sure. Um, but once it's planted, pennycrest can be, be an issue um, for whatever reason. I've had multiple growers, including myself, where pennycrest just comes on beautifully, uh, almost like a second crop. Me too. Uh, yeah, and it, it does freeze off, and the next spring, it's not an issue, uh, from what from my experience anyway. Um, and I, you know, being an organic farmer, I don't get so worked up about you know a few weeds here and there. But um, the first year, just be ready for things not to look absolutely perfect. The second year, um, it's always beautiful. Uh, any experience that I've had, it's already established and it outcompetes anything the second year. Third year is the same. Um, and I'll kind of move from planting through mid-season management, and then I'll go into how we uh, harvest it. Looks like we're doing okay on time. So there's a few different options. You can swath it, which is what I would recommend. You can use a stripper head. Um, or you can use a straight head, which I would not recommend. Uh, people have tried it. We've tried it uh, the first year, and um, it it's too green. So the way that the plant works is it has a long seed head on it, and it dries from the top down. So the top two thirds will become dry, and the bottom third will be, will remain green, and that's the challenge. So if you have a stripper head, 
I kind of feel like you may be missing out on some yield with that bottom third that isn't quite right. And um, that kind of led us to using the swather. And um, it is something that you have to check your fields daily and try to make the best call you can as far as when to take it. I've noticed that the top seed uh, flutes will start dropping seed. And that's always been my cue as far as, okay, it's time to go cut this crop. And I've noticed that if I cut the crop at that time, the rest of the seed heads won't continue to drop seeds, but it'll allow the bottom third to dry out. You always take a risk as far as rain after you put it in the windrow. Um, I've had perfect conditions and I've had absolutely horrendous conditions after I've laid it down in the swath. And remember this crop is five, six feet tall and you have a massive swath there that doesn't dry out that easy. You wouldn't think it would, but it does dry out if you have a rain event. I had knocked it down with no rain in the forecast. The next day we got an inch and a half of pounding rain on it, pushed it down in the stubble, and then it rained for six days consecutively after that. So I, every day it was like, okay, another day of rain, another day of rain. And I thought, well, this is the year we mow it under because it's going to sprout in the swath. It never did. And um, that sixth or seventh day, the sun came out and the humidity lifted. And that stuff dried out in like three hours. In the morning, there was no chance of combining. And I was combining by six o'clock that night. It reminded me a lot of like road ditch hay. The stems are hollow and it does release the uh, moisture relatively easy. Um, that year I had, uh, some of the best quality grain that I've ever had. Um, and I had some of the best yield. I do contribute some of the yield that year to letting it lay in the swath that long. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of different, uh, things to keep in mind when you're swathing. But, um, if I had to make the call and I knew rain was coming and it wasn't dried out quite enough. If it didn't look like a large rain event, in my opinion, I would let it lay. And that sounds really sketchy and scary, but just from what I've experienced, I've been okay with doing that. And I did that this last year and it turned out great. Didn't lose quality at all. Um, let's see, as far as the stripper head goes, um, I've never personally used one. Um, Let's see, I think you end up with some green material in the hopper when you do that. And you know, I you may lose out on some yield, but I'm not sure. But I'll move move on from swathing now. Oh, I, I'll tell you the height that I swath it at. Remember, it's like five, six feet tall. I usually raise my swather up uh, to about, about 10 inches off the ground. So there's a lot of air underneath that swath and it stands on top of the stubble really well. Um, you know, you have all of this stem and just a little bit of seed head on the top. So you have to just keep that into consideration as far as how big a swath you're taking that your combine can handle when once it's time to come out with the pickup head. Um, it doesn't feed very nice with your pickup head. Um, so when you're swathing, the straighter and the smoother and the more consistent you are with that machine, that makes combining uh, much more fun as well. So I'll kind of move on to when it's in the swath, it's dried down now. Um, usually you can tell if you've ever harvested small grains, if the swath is ready or not. Um, combine settings are kind of unique. Uh, you're harvesting uh, grass seed. It's These combines are set up for large, heavy seeds. This is a small, light seed. Um, so the first thing, we've done is we take the concaves out and we put in small grain concaves. This last year, I also put filler plates on the concaves. I did the first two sets with filler plates. I skipped one and I did a third one. And right where the return comes in to, that, uh, to the concaves there, I put a, a filler plate. So that the second time it would come into the machine and get rethrashed, it would hold it in there for a second and do some more threshing. Um, and then I also set up the, uh, set up the concaves, um, and I recommend you get the book out and do it step by step, uh, how the book recommends, but I set up my concaves 
So when I spin the rotor, um, it'll tick on the concave. That's how tight the machine is set. And when I hear it tick, I back it off one turn or, you know, just enough where you couldn't, you know, you could fit a, a credit card in between there. But that, so that's how tight that I have it set. And I've had it close before, but not that tight. And I went back home with the combine because the sample in the, in the hopper wasn't acceptable at all. So getting it that close does matter. Um, and then, so once the concaves are in, filler plates are great. Um, my rotor speed is usually pretty high. I usually have that spinning pretty fast, like a thousand RPMs. Every combine is going to be a little different. Um, but I've always had mine set pretty high. And then my wind speeds, um, I, I don't want to give you any specific numbers, but it's been 750 plus. I've always have a second person with me um, when I'm harvesting and they'll drag a bed sheet behind the combine and we'll go a hundred yards. We'll stop. We'll look in the bed sheet for any kernels that uh, shouldn't be blowing out. And I will keep increasing my wind speed until I get those. And then I'll back it down again. Um, but it is almost impossible to tell if you're losing anything out the back with one person. Uh, it's it's crucial to have two people when we're talking pounds breaker, not bushels breaker, every bushel counts. So I really recommend just taking your time and having some help when you do that first couple of rounds. Um, so the wind is, that's how I usually run my wind. Uh, concaves are tight. I set my top sieve uh, almost pretty much shut because I use a corn and soybean sieve. So the holes are still pretty big. And then I have my bottom sieve set. Okay. <laughs> so you have like a hundred bushels right here. I have my uh, I have my bottom sieve set. Sorry, Luke. I, I accidentally unmuted there. There you go. You're good. There you go. So obviously, I have the bottom sieve set so that anything that's unthreshed, because they come in flutes, and there's about five seeds in each flute. Sometimes they have a little bit of stem still attached to them. So I set my bottom sieve almost closed. So they, they go over the back and back into the return. And then they hit that filler plate that I talked about earlier and kind of get a second threshing. Um, and that's, you know, the best thing to do when I can put my number in the chat here. If you are harvesting Kernza and you have any questions and you want to bounce something out, you know, bounce things off of me or anybody else, uh, just call somebody that's done it. Because when you're out there, it can be terribly frustrating. And it's real easy just to get in the combine and say, I'm going to combine this and get it done. Um, so I can put my chat, my number in the chat later. Um, but we should leave some time for questions. We kind of got now through the combining, the grains in the hopper, the sample looks good. Um, I'll go on to, um, from that point, we've always stored it in bins with floors. Uh, more than likely, this crop will go for food grain. So I think that's terrible, you know, incredibly important that you have a floor and a fan underneath of it. Um, it does kind of bridge up and compact depending on if you have any weed seeds in there or uh, you know what your sample looks like. So you have to get some good air going through it. If you have good air going through it, this crop dries out really well. Uh, it's just like storing any other small grain crop. So I'll just stop there and we'll have some time left for questions here. Awesome, thanks Luke. Um, there was a couple questions about uh, using it as a grazing or hay crop. Uh, the first one being, um, <clears throat> can you graze it and then harvest it for grain in the same year? Yeah, you can. Um, you might have to help me out, but there's that there's that flag leaf inside of the stem. And if that hasn't begun to develop yet, you can graze it up to that point. But once that flag leaf is inside of the stem or just beca becoming developed, then you, that's the time to quit, but you can up to that point. Um, and obviously, after harvest uh, is a great time to turn cattle out on this. Um, it stays green if you know it. It's it'll. I bet it's green underneath the snow right now with the with the insulation we have with the snow. But it'll stay green until it's covered with snow late into December, January. 
I've dug up two feet of snow and it's still green underneath now. Um, so it works great for grazing after for sure. Um, in the springtime, you also can mow it, you know, before that flag leaf starts to develop. And I'm going to try that this year just to try to set back some perennial weeds and then have the currents that come through and try to outcompete it. So you have an idea of what it would yield for hay? Like, I guess after after three years or so, if you want to keep it around. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to get I don't know for sure. I've never taken it as hay. But I can tell you that I usually get um, two bales per acre when I harvest the straw. So I I use the straw as bedding for our livestock on our farm. And then we have a few different fields. So I always rotate which field that I take straw from. And the straw, it, even after harvest, I usually have the baler come pretty close right behind the combine because it's already been in the swath and dried down. And I'll use that as bedding. And depending on the time of year or the needs of the cattle, he'll eat their bedding because it has so much nutrition. So it's I throw out a bale of alfalfa, a bale of bedding, and sometimes they'll eat the, the currents that I want to use for bedding as feed. So that's, uh, besides the taking it as hay, the bedding is another use for it as well. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And what, do it, does anybody know what the bushel weight of currents is? Has that even been established? I don't think so. I don't know if you've heard anything, Ben, but I haven't, I haven't got anything real sure no. yet. We had an effort to identify that about a year and a half ago, but uh, getting the <laughs> other things going is, has been a priority. It's in the upper forties, probably. I mean, but we, yeah, it's it's yet to be dis determined. <clears throat> We've always uh, that's kind of why we went with we sell it by clean by a clean pound. So after it's cleaned and dehulled, we have a saleable product at a you know a price per pound. So. Mm -hmm. Do you have conventional folks that can kill it off with Roundup? Is that able to kill it or do you really have to go after it some more? I I don't have, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't have any experience with that. Um, I don't see why it'd be any different than, I shouldn't say at all because I've just never asked and I've never talked to anybody about it. 